is great to see all of you here this morning. Uh, I just want to welcome you. I want to welcome all of you who are at our Kitchener campus uh, watching as well and everyone who's watching online. I don't know about you, but uh, sometimes I like to take a few minutes and just, uh, you know, remember the past, right? And Christmas is one of those times. When I think of Christmas, I think back to, you know, some of my, the best memories of Christmas that I have are, are that picture of Christmas morning, that anticipation that, that just like uh, this pile of gifts here, this, this imagination in my mind that as when I was a kid that the tree was going to be packed with gifts, right, overflowing with gifts around that tree, so many gifts big ones like this, that it just took the whole space that you couldn't see the tree. Now, how many of you have that type of anticipation, right? You know, you were excited, you had those memories as a kid, right? That there were these gifts that were going to be there. And it's something about uh, just the excitement of that. My parents, they were really smart. They, They were smart because what they used to do was they would leave one gift unwrapped, they leave this gift unwrapped so that when I got up at like five in the morning or four in the morning and ran downstairs to see uh, what Santa had brought me and brought my brother, my sisters and, and me, uh, here was this unwrapped gift that I could right then in that moment play with and have some fun with. Because here's what my parents really wanted. They wanted to be able to sleep in. Right? They were so smart. I don't know. I didn't pick that up from them. I should, have, I should have did that. But there's something about this image that we have, right? This anticipation. And it really is that the gifts are there. You know, this, this uh, you know, maybe a little bit of uncertainty, but the hope that there would be these gifts kind of right there. I want to say to you that Christmas really allows us to think about, I, I think, one gift that is so important. And it's this gift. It's the gift of hope. Now when, I, when I think about Christmas, I, re, I really think about this whole idea of hope. Hope that can be a part of my life. Hope that can be a part of your life. And, and the importance of hope. Because I really think all of us want some hope in our lives. I don't think I've ever uh, ran into somebody that said, you know, if I, when I grow up, I, I want to be hopeless. Right? I don't know if you, I sure haven't run into anybody that, that said that. You know, I don't want any hope in my life. I'd rather be hopeless. And I, I actually really believe that, that hope is so important for our lives. That hope is, is matter of fact, some, somebody said this. They said, you know, that you can live, uh, you know, maybe three minutes with, without oxygen. And you can live maybe three days without water. And maybe you can live three weeks without something to eat, but you can't live a second without hope in your life. And I really think it is so important, it's so essential for all of us that in the, in the dark moments when we're going through life that there is something to hold on to. And I really think Christmas is a time for us to reflect and understand that it is this gift of hope that God wants to have and give us at, that comes through this time of year. You know, when I, when I think about this time of year as well, and I think about our lives, I also think that there's, there's a reality that there's other gifts and not so good gifts that kind of we encounter in our lives. I think there's this gift of disappointment. You know, this, this reality in our lives that, that there are these things that we're just not happy with. You know, we heard some news about our health. We heard some crisis in our family. We're not, we're not happy with the circumstances at work and we, or whatever it might be. We're just not really happy with where life is. And so there's these dis- disappointments that come into our life. And so we have these type of gifts, not good gifts, that we wrestle with as well, that kind of push against hope in our lives. I think there's, a, there's another gift that we encounter in our lives that I think is even a little deeper and bigger than disappointment. Here it is. It's hurt. You, you know what hurt is? It's, it's, it's this reality that, that someone has done something to you 
that you don't deserve, you didn't expect, you didn't ask for it, and you're left holding this gift. You're left holding this hurt and all the consequences and everything that's around it. And you find yourself in this place that where can you find any hope? And maybe even going to the place where you, you are mad at God. And we can find ourselves with really receiving this whole idea of hurt and this gift in our lives. Or maybe it is the gift of guilt. You know, this idea that when we, we look at our lives, that you, we see where we messed up. We see the mistakes. We see the regrets. And we see the shame in our lives. And this, too, is, a, is something that, that holds us back from experiencing the hope that I think God has for us. When our lives are filled with, with disappointment and are filled with hurts or are filled with guilt in our lives, I think it, it, it really doesn't allow us to take hold of really the hope that God wants for us. And so today I'm hoping, <laughs> I'm believing, that we can unpack this reality of the gift of Christmas brings us hope. And that we can find a way that in spite of disappointment or hurt or guilt that we might have holding on to these negative gifts in our lives, that today instead we're going to find out the hope that God has for us and what it can do for our lives. Well, I think there's, this is really important for us. I think we need to answer this question. We need to answer what is hope? I think that's the best place to start because I really think, I know I have been in times, but I think we're confused about what hope means. I think we're confused with, with what is this whole idea of what hope is. This is what I want you to do. I want you to turn to the person next to you and say, you're confused about hope. Yeah, go ahead, tell them. Because they, they need to figure that out. Right? That this reality that, that, you know, maybe we're not quite sure what hope is. Because I, I think in some ways we think hope is really this. We think it's wishful thinking, and it's not. You know, just like at this time of year, as a child, I had my wish list. I had this list of things that I wished I could get, and I, I go up to Santa, and I ask him to fulfill that wish list. Or we have a birthday, and we ask people to blow out the candles and make a wish. Or we find ourselves dealing with disappointments or guilt or hurt in our lives and we just wish we wishfully hope that there's an answer for those things but we're not really sure what those what the answer is what the hope is or where the hope is found in our lives and I think that's where it confuses us and that's where we run into problems is because we really see hope as being wishful or hopeful wishes let me give you this definition. It's in your notes. A wish is a desire for something that is uncertain. A wish is a desire for something that's uncertain. You know, there's no certainty in it. You know, you, you're, you're just, you might be wishfully hopeful for something, but you're not really sure it's going to take place. And we do that all the time. We make lots of different wishes and we're hopeful for a lot of different things, but we're not really certain of those things. Now, you may not know this, but I am a huge football fan, okay? Just a surprise for some of you. And most importantly, I am a huge fan of the Chicago Bears. Like, they are the best team in all the world, okay? Just in case you're wondering. And this year, they're having this incredible, incredible year. Their defense is like lights out. They're playing amazing. So I am hopeful I am so hopeful they're going to go and win the Super Bowl. I really am. But when you really ask me how I really feel, I'm really wishing. Right? Because I'm really wishing on something that is so uncertain. But I often can insert that hopeful. We do that in so many different places that we, we say that we're hopeful on things that we're uncertain about. Listen, I wish. I hope. I wishfully hope the Chicago Bears are going to win the Super Bowl, but I've also seen the other teams that they're up against. I've seen some bad times when they didn't play well. 
And so when it really comes down to it, this is really, this is really what I am. I'm just wishing because it's in something that's uncertain. And I think when we mix that up, what we mix hope up with this, with this definition, when we mix hope up with this, we become disappointed or we face hurts or we feel guilt in our lives that just seem overwhelming and we feel that there is no place and no ability to get hope in our lives. But I want to say to you that there is a different definition of hope. There's a a definition of hope that is a, a biblical hope that's deeper and bigger. And this is what it is. It's hope is a certainty in the good to come. You know, when the Bible talks about hope, it really is talking about this certainty in the good to come for our lives, for our circumstances, for what we're facing. And so I might not be able to say that about the Chicago Bears. I, there's a lot of uncertainty, and, and, and I don't know if I can have this type of hope. I'm wishful. That's what wishfulness is. But there is a hope. There's a hope that I want to talk about today that really says that there's a certainty of the good to come in our lives. I love what Princess Leia said. Said this, hope is like the sun. If you only believe in it, when you can see it, you'll never make it through the night. And you think about that for a minute, it really is, you know, when the dark times come, if it's only wishful thinking, if it's only wishful hope that that you have in your life, and you only believe it when you see it, then you don't really have the hope that will carry you through. You don't really have the hope that will walk you through those dark times of your life. Theologian N.T. Wright says this, hope instead for the Christian is not wishful thinking or mere blind optimism. It is a mode of knowing. It's the certainty of knowing that there is the good to come in our lives. And so, here it is. That's the hope that we're going to talk about today. That's the hope that, that I think the Christmas story is, shares with us. When I look at the Christmas story of Mary and Joseph and the shepherds and all that takes place in the Christmas story, it really is this declaration of hope to all of mankind. And so we find in Luke this this great verse, this great proclamation. The shepherds, the shepherds are out in the field. Mary and Joseph have found, found no room in the inn, but they found a, a place in a stable, in a place to have the baby Jesus. And so we have, at this moment, the angels coming and proclaiming to a group of shepherds, and they say these words. They say, don't be afraid, he said. I bring you good news that will bring great joy to all people. The Savior, yes, the Messiah, the Lord, has been born today in Bethlehem, the city of David. And you will recognize him by this sign. You will find a baby wrapped snugly in strips of cloth, lying in a manger. And then suddenly the angel was joined by a vast host of others, the armies of heaven, praising God and saying, Glory to God in the highest, heaven and peace on earth to those with whom God is pleased. And so we have this great part of the Christmas story that has this angel visiting the shepherds and making this great proclamation of something that's going to change the world. Now for you and I, when we read that at first, it doesn't maybe feel like it means that much. It might not even uh, have that much of a meaning to us because we didn't live in that time. But here's what's really interesting. Here's a little history for you to understand how powerful these statements by the angel were to these shepherds. See, these shepherds were Jewish. They were Jews. And Jews, as we read about them in the Old Testament, are God's people, that God set up this nation called the nation of Israel. And throughout their lives, God was walking with them. God was being a part of their lives. And God was making promises to them 
and sometimes we call them prophecies, through the prophets, through the Old Testament, he was making promises to the Jewish people. And so the Christmas story is all about the fulfillment of these promises that God was making to the Jewish people. And so when this angel came and appeared that night, here's how impactful it was. When he said, this is your savior, this is the Messiah, this is your Lord, those very words triggered something in those shepherds. They realized that for hundreds of years, the nation, their people, the Jewish people, have been waiting for this very moment. They've been waiting for this Messiah to come, this Savior, this Lord, to impact the entire world. And so for them, this had this incredible meaning to their lives, that it was being fulfilled on this very night, the prophecies, the promises that God had made to them. And they were going to be a part of it. How incredible, how hopeful. It was moving beyond just wishful thinking of when the Messiah was gonna take place, but now in this very moment, the hope for the entire world had been born. And so here's the truth about the hope that you and I talk about. It's this, is that hope is rooted in God's promises. If you and I were to take a journey across the Old Testament, and spend, you know, probably far too long than you would want to be here uh, this morning. But here's what we would discover. You would discover that there are over 400 prophecies or promises about this person, this Messiah, this Christ, Jesus, across the Old Testament. And what's fascinating is the number of them are written from a thousand, fifteen hundred years before this very moment of when Jesus is born. It's amazing you read there the, in, in that verse, in that story about how will you know it's the Messiah, the angel said. Because you will go, you'll find him in Bethlehem, in the city of David. You'll find him in a manger and he'll be wrapped in these cloths. And that very prophecy, that very promise you can read about in the Old Testament. The very details of where Jesus was to be born is found hundreds of years before it takes place. And so this idea of hope is rooted in God's promises. The Christmas story is this fulfillment of God's promises. It's not merely some fairy tales or some wishful thinking, but instead it's rooted in actual events of what's taken place historically, that's the hope. That's the type of hope we're talking about. That's the type of hope that the Christmas story brings for you and me. This hope that is grounded in the promises of God that are true, that are real, that have been fulfilled. Over 400 of them can be traced to what Jesus' birth, resurrection, and all that he did for us while he was here. How incredible is that? That's not rooted in something uncertain. That's rooted in the truth, in the hope is rooted in God's promises. I think back to my own life. In a moment of incredible disappointment and despair, about eight plus years ago, when, when Carolyn and I were, were walking in this moment and in this place of, of really disappointment in the midst of a transition, I remember being in that moment and reflecting, and we were just talking about this uh, uh, this past week, that, that in that moment there was something, there was a truth, there was something we were holding on to, it was the hope that we were holding on to, that, that 10, 15 years earlier, there was someone that prayed over us, there was someone that spoke into our lives some promises that said that God was going to do something with us. Some pretty amazing things. And we just kind of tucked that away. We put that away into, into our pocket and just held on to that to see what God was going to do. And it was in that, the, that dark moment that it was brought back to us, that we remembered again the promise that God had made, 
Not just that promise through that person praying over us, but the promises that are found throughout the Bible, throughout the New Testament, about what he has for you, the future that he has for you. And when we think about hope and we think about Christmas hope, it's like that reality that we, when we face our disappointments and the guilt and the hurt in our lives, we can be rooted in the promises of God. That it doesn't have to be uncertainty when we're going through those moments and those dark times. But just like those shepherds, they were going about their lives. It was dark at night. There was chaos in the land because the Romans were overseeing things. But here was this declaration of truth that now hope had come. Promises have been fulfilled that this birth of Jesus was to bring what? It was to bring hope and peace and joy to everyone. That's a hope that's rooted in God's promises. And so today, when we understand and we walk with the gift that is the gift of God in our lives, the gift of hope in our lives, it's being rooted in God's promises for all of us. I want to look a little deeper at this. I want to dig a little deeper, and there's, there's a guy named Paul who wrote a big portion of the New Testament. He wrote to this group of Christians in Rome that this hope that was rooted in God's promises began to spread all over after Jesus' birth and after his resurrection, began to spread all over the known world to where it made its place to the, the capital of the Roman Empire, Rome itself. And Paul writes these words to the Roman Christians. He says this, I pray that God, the source of hope, will fill you completely with joy and peace because you trust in him. Then you will overflow with confident hope through the power of the Holy Spirit. I think there's some great points in here that I want to kind of unpack and, and really for us to understand that this reality that the gift of hope comes from God. It's rooted in God's promises, but it also comes from him, that he's the source of our hope. It comes from him. And so let's take a look at this verse. It says, I pray that God, the source of hope. I think when Paul writes this, and he's writing to the, these, these Roman Christians, he's saying, you know what? Where is your focus? You know, who are you praying to? You know, who are you reaching out to? Who are you asking for help, for hope? What is that source in your life? I think many of us, we pray, and as Christ followers, there's a real purpose in our prayer. But I, I think people, even, even non-followers of Christ, pray. I think we all reach out to people, to, or we ask something or, or someone to, to help us, uh, to give us hope. I give this definition to prayer, is that it's a sincere request for help or an expression of thanks to someone significant, someone, something and so when I look at what, what Paul is writing here, he's saying, you know, who is that someone? Who is that request going to? Who is that source of who you're reaching out for the help and hope in your life? And he's saying to the Romans, and he's saying to us today that that source, that hope needs to be in God. He's saying that, that I pray that God would be your source of hope. That that would be the source that would be a part of your life that, that you would ask yourself this question. You would ask yourself this question this morning. That you would say, you know, who is it that I pray to? What is it that I pray to? What is the source of my hope? Have you ever asked yourself that question? What is the source of your hope? Of why you live your life? Of how you get through dark times? Where is that hope? It goes on to say this. I pray that God, the source of your hope, will fill you completely. This amazing reality that, that God wants to be the source of our hope. And if our focus is really, if he's our source, then, or is it something else that's the source of our hope? When I think about that and I ask myself that question, what are the things that I fill my life with that begin to fill my life to become that source in my life? Is it finances? Is it material things? Have I looked to those for the hope 
and confidence and security in my life? Have I looked at uh, in the mirror and I look at my health and this incredible physique and just go, hey, you know, there's where my hope and what I trust in. Is it in my accomplishments, my job, my friends? Are those the things that fill our lives? Those things that we chase after that in many ways are, are fleeting and, and won't last. I think he's saying to us, you know what, pray to God the source of hope because that will fill you completely. But if your source of hope is something else, that is filling you so completely that you're not allowing God to be the one that you, you trust in. You're not allowing God to be the source of hope for your life. Instead, you're allowing all these other things that you're chasing after, and they'll leave you completely unfulfilled in our lives. And then what happens when we, we have God as the source, and they'll fill us completely? What does it say? It says that you will be filled with joy and peace. Here's a great gift, right? This great gift of joy and peace in our lives, that, that when, when Jesus, when God is the, the source of our hope, that we experience this joy and peace that can be in our lives, not just a little bit, but it just fills you completely, this joy and peace in our lives. Because how, why, what happens? Because you trust in him. Think about it. When I have God as my source, and I'm allowing him to fill my life, and I want to experience the joy and the peace in my life, how do I do that? It's by trusting him completely with my life. Instead of looking to the reality of all these other things that I can fill my life with. I can fill my life with, with finances and realize that when there's a downturn in the stock market, it doesn't last. Or downturn in my investments or a downturn at work or a downturn in my circumstances. I lose that security instead of my source being in God and in his hope. Or when I look at myself and, and here's the reality that, that this physical body is going to droop and sag and wrinkle all around me and ultimately fail. And when I put my hope in that instead of my hope in God as the source, I lose out. I lose out in the hope and the joy and the peace because I'm not trusting in, in God. I'm trusting in that. Or friends or accomplishments, you fill in the blank. Whatever it is, those are fleeting. None of those are eternal. But God, his hope, based on his promises, the source of hope will fill us completely because we trust in him. And so when I face these disappointments in my life, you know, disappointments of, of where my life has gone or what's happening in my life. You know, God says, come to me. Come to me, the source of hope. Come to me, the source of hope that, will, that you, can, you can honestly bring your disappointments to me. And I will completely fill you with the joy and hope if you trust me. Trust me with your disappointments or my hurts. When I, when I look at the hurts in my life that, that God says, you know, trust me with the hurts in your life. Trust me with, with the things that have happened to you. Trust me with the circumstances of your life. And I can bring healing into your life because I know what betrayal is. I know what great suffering is. I died on a cross for you. And then ultimately the guilt, the mistakes, the shame. He says, to each one of us that, that Jesus died on this cross. He gave his life to take on your guilt and your shame so you might experience the hope and the peace and the joy that's found in him as the source. And so no matter what the label is, no matter what we're facing, he says, you know what? Allow me to fill you completely with joy and peace because you trust in him then you will overflow with confident hope through the power of the Holy Spirit. There's this confident hope that we can now rest in. It's not something that's wishful thinking. It's not something that we're uncertain about, but it's a certain confident hope that comes in trusting in God 
And it's a joy and a peace that will fill our lives. It'll take away those bad gifts. It'll give us these new gifts of joy and peace and his love in our lives. And I think it goes deeper than that. I think this gift of hope, it changes us. This gift of hope changes each one of us when we allow it to take, to be what we trust in, that we trust in God. Look at what Paul writes earlier to the Romans. He said this, we can rejoice too, then we run into problems and trials, for we know that they help develop endurance, and endurance develops strength of character, and character strengthens our confidence of hope of salvation. And this hope will not lead to disappointment, for we know who, who dearly God loves us, how dearly God loves us, because he has given us the Holy Spirit to fill our hearts with his love. And here's, here's the hope we're talking about, this type of hope that in the midst of the circumstances, in the midst of when we get knocked down, we get right back up when things don't go our way. This is the type of hope that, that Paul's talking about. It's this reality that we stare the troubles, the trials, the situations straight in the face, and we push back of it because of the certainty of the good to come of what God wants to do in our lives. It changes who we are. Not only that, but the gift of hope, and it wouldn't be a Christmas story without this, is found in Jesus. When you think about the Christmas story, and you think about this proclamation that the, the shepherds brought, that Jesus is born, the hope for the entire world, that's the hope you and I can have. This reality that the, the Christmas promises, the promises of God are fulfilled completely in Jesus. And Jesus, just before he started his ministry, he stood up before a group of Jews and he read these words. The spirit of the Lord is upon me, for he has anointed me to bring good news to the poor. He has sent me to proclaim the captives will be released and that the blind will be set, will see, and that the oppressed will be set free and that the time of the Lord's favor has come. The same verse that we read in Luke is actually in Isaiah. This proclamation that, that Jesus is this fulfillment and that our faith our trusting in God, our hope is rooted not in a fairy tale, not in a myth, but in a historical person of Jesus that he came to fulfill all these things. And the Christmas story is this reality of this hope being fulfilled for our lives. I love what Billy Graham says. It says, for the believer, there is hope beyond the grave because Jesus Christ has opened the door to heaven for us by his death and resurrection. And so Jesus, the gift of Christmas is one that is rooted in who Jesus is and what Jesus has done, the reality that God has made good on his promises for our lives, that you are set free from your disappointments and your hurts and your guilt through Jesus Christ, that he comes alongside of us, that there's a hope that is sure, it is a hope that is confident that we can walk with him and with God. And that we are anchored in something that isn't just uncertainty, that isn't wishful, hopeful optimism, but it is a hope that is certain for all of our lives. And that we, as followers of Christ, can be people of hope. We can be grandparents of hope. We can be parents of hope. We can be young adults of hope. We can be, have marriages of hope and relationships of hope. And we can be this people of hope to a world, a dark world, that needs a message, a gift of hope around us. And so the Christmas gifts of hope, of hope is really anchored in Jesus, in who he is, in what he's done, and what he's gonna do in our lives. And so how can you and I experience hope in life? First of all, by being people of hope. By being people of hope that are proclaiming this hope this message of hope to everyone around us. To, in the moments of our disappointments, in the moments where we find ourselves in circumstances, that let's be people that proclaim hope to those around us. You know, there's one way you can do that really simply. You can take one of these cards and you can proclaim the hope. 
Maybe someone you know this Christmas season needs to hear the message of a Savior, needs to hear the message of hope, needs to hear the message of peace and joy in their lives. And so I encourage you to, to take some of these cards and go out and invite someone. Invite someone to the Christmas Eve services to allow them to experience the hope that they can have in their lives. And finally, by trusting in the source of hope. No matter where you are today, no matter what your circumstances are, God has a promise for you. God has a hope for you. God wants to fill your life with joy and peace. Let's pray. God, I just thank you. I thank you, God, that you're at work in every one of our lives. God, that you love us and you care for us. And God, I pray that each one of us would experience the joy and peace that comes in knowing the hope that we have in you. God, today I pray that we would just experience that. Each person would know and receive the gift of hope today, I pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.